Hey everyone, this video is about the history of media effects relative to chapter 2 of Living in a Media World. This is for Communication 1307, Introduction to Mass Communication. The content that's in this video will also be located in chapter 2, page 32 through 36. So let's get right into it. The direct effects model the limited effects model and the critical cultural model will be discussed in specific in this video. So let's jump right into the direct effects model. So the rise of a mass society in the early 1800s, as you see here on the left hand side, is a direct indication to prior to the 1800s when most Europeans, most people that lived in North America during this time. Obviously, we're seeing the revolution of the French uh, in the 1700s and also the American Revolution. So what we're also seeing is the increase in, uh, of the Industrial Revolution on society and how it's taking hold and creating new opportunities for people to move out of a small, close-knit community into what is deemed as a mass society where people move away from farms into factories to find work. We see this all over the world. We have seen it over the last 20 or so years in China where people who live on farms uh, obviously look for work and they find their way into a mass uh, populated city where in the late 1700s, the study of the migration from farm to city also came with some concern, with some fear that people were no longer going to get their news and information from small close-knit communities like family members, friends, but rather they would learn and get their information about society, about religion, about politics, about race, about gender, through these inexp inexpensive newspapers known as the Penny Press, which we'll learn about in the newspaper chapter, but also mediums that are in print, such as magazines at the Times, and books and novels. So people became more isolated as they moved into bigger cities. The concerned critic the observer said that media is deemed as quite powerful in this new environment and it can be highly persuasive if this is the only opinion or information source that people were going to be receiving. I wonder if this sounds familiar to you, especially when we look at the last 10 years or so with the rise of smart devices in children or even teenagers and how cyberbullying or other issues related to depression or social media's influence, what you'll typically see in the media is this concern, this direct effects or what we know as powerful effects paradigm or way of thinking about the media. So as we discussed in chapter one uh, in the section on media literacy and media consumers often assuming that the media have large uh, perhaps persuasive negative effects on people that they often look to blame the media for our complex social issues and problems. And so this opens up in giving us some historical context about how we viewed the effects of media on us. And so as we evolve in our thinking, as mediums become more available beyond just a print medium, like newspapers or magazines, but now in the electronic era in the early 19th century um, or 1900, excuse me, the limited effects model is what generates a new way of thinking, if you will, a new paradigm, also known as the indirect effects model that is discussed in this chapter. Whereas propaganda and you know misinformation, even the rise of of yellow journalism and sensationalism in print news, right, came the rise of the radio, 
And so still during this time, there was a huge concern that these mass messages that were being produced over radio waves in the 1930s, that they actually overwhelmed people um, in the absence of their family members and community. And so in the 1940s and 50s, uh, researchers, however, they kind of doubted what media messages would provide and did they have a sort of this hypodermic needle approach as is also mentioned in some other studies in direct effects model. Uh, was it uh, that impactful? And so a lot of the studies that are happening in the 1940s and 50s um, would suggest that the direct effects model is doesn't really pertain to everybody. And it's silly to think that, right? So the scholars in this era, in this limited effects model, would, would largely discredit the direct effects approach. And they would argue because of studies that they did on voter behavior in the 1940s and 50s by Paul Lazarfeld that the People's Choice Study in the 1940s would suggest that people usually uh, when they're looking at who to vote for, for example, in this study uh, looked at, you know, are political advertisements effective? Do, are they persuasive? And to some degree, they probably are. Otherwise, we wouldn't be seeing them in this political season. But Lazarfeld goes on to find that people usually are influenced more by their friends, family, which is also known as the opinion leaders in their lives, not the advertiser, not the pundit that's maybe sharing the message on a mass uh, medium. So what he comes up with is a two-step flow process where the opinion leader is the one that's consuming, you know, the political messages because maybe they're, they're interested in that. It's entertaining to them. And so they're more um, informed in that sense. They maybe have already their political ideology has already been formulated, and so their job is to then go and um, persuade their social networks. And so that's where, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all these other places now that we have, they become relative, right? They become rel relevant in our society because we find ourselves inside of these sort of echo chambers and places where, you know, we, we find our opinion leaders or the opinion leaders you know, maybe find us and they, you know, sort of reinforce those political ideologies upon us. And so maybe that's um, in keeping with what Lazarfeld f uh, finds that we could study more of. So there's another approach here, which is on the right hand side, which looks at the critical uh, theory, uh, the critical and cultural model. And so after the indirect effects approach, uh, we're no longer looking at, you know, do messages have an effect on individuals, but um, do they have, you know, is there a societal sort of holistic, systematic approach to this? And many would argue that there is a way to look at it from a very holistic point of view. And that's what the last model gives us. So the critical cultural model originates between World War I and II by the Frankfurt School. And these scholars are uh, noted in the textbook as uh, recent Karl Marx or Marxist uh, theorists in the idea of looking at the entire system as a problem. Uh, in this case, we could look at the economic system, say capitalism or even communism. Uh, or even fascism during this time is what rose during, uh, you know, between the areas of, of World War I and II. And when we're looking at the Frankfurt School in Germany, obviously their approach is pretty geographically influence, influenced by what's going on within their region. So it, it, it's interesting to note that these scholars had a certain social view, had a certain political view. They were really concerned with, you know, the the uprising, the you know, the rise of fascism and you know how how this sort of led to 
uh, their key principles of, of looking at society from a certain point of view. So there's a lot of key principles here, but one of them that stuck out was that society is coming to be dominated by a cultural industry. And media scholars would interpret that as the media, right? Being a cultural industry, a powerful sort of uh, influential systematic uh, set of images, right? That we get every day. And it's to be criticized, it's to be looked at from a certain point of view. So there are some other principles that uh, are noted in here, but that society, you know, if you if you you know if you look at all of the things that have happened just over the last year in 2020, right? You can't make sense out of these ideas, these protests, the coronavirus, right? You can't make sense of these events, right? This whole pandemic situation if you take it out of our historical context, right? If you take it out of, you know, uh, what what is surrounding us, right? So the, so the media itself is a reflection of the social structures, right? And that's really what it examines. It looks at how people use the media to construct their views of the world and examines not just the individual effects, because they're really concerned with how these social structures, right? Give it the economic structure or the uh, social structure, like what we're what we're currently dealing with with regards to inequities, whether that be racial or economical or social inequities. This is where a lot of that work comes in. And this is a lot of where that perspective comes in. So. Um, it notes here that up through the 1940s, most of the researchers of mass media focused on direct and indirect effects, uh, as noted in the first two models. But that um, it's not just about behaviors of groups and individuals, but rather how people might use media to construct their view of the world or view of, you know, where they live. And instead of you know, maybe using a survey to look at some, you know, to gather data and, and reflect on it to figure out, you know, who did people vote for or what are they watching or, you know, does, you know, d does, you know, streaming have an effect on people or does gaming have an effect? It's not really focused on that. Critical cultural model is really focused on considering making meaning within a society based on what you you know what what's being shown who controls the media systems which is also in chapter 3 is really why that was written because it's concerning who owns the system right and the roles that media play in our lives so instead of looking at how messages affect people it looks at how people use and construct those messages in order to empower themselves or to re-examine, you know, the stereotypes that might exist within the media uh, messages that we get. So, you know, there's a lot of examples of these um, models, but I just had a moment to go over all three. So as a recap, the direct effects model was really at a point where we didn't know too much about our, our the effects of media and what it would have on us. It was kind of foreign to us, you know, this sort of systematic way of sharing information. And one of the easiest ways to react to it is to be scared of it, is to fear it. And so as we evolved, we learned more and realized that, yeah, it doesn't maybe have that much power, but rather it does, you know, maybe suggest like the agenda uh, setting theory mentions you know it's not necessarily that media media tell us what to think but rather what to think about and that's a, re a direct reflection of the limited effects model and that's kind of what rose out of that is that idea that media uh, owners might set the agenda but they're not necessarily you know telling us what to think but rather what to think about and talk about so it has kind of more indirect effect and then the critical cultural model is you know the suggestion that the audience is more active less passive 
and they're really asking uh, questions more so related to the system and how that is attempting to dominate um, our, you know, culture or, you know, throw in a new uh, idea and sort of maybe make that mainstream when the audience member really can dive in and think more critically about these messages from a systematic point of view. I thank you guys for watching. Have a good rest of your day.